Jones. I don't know, Sasha. Did you hear what we were talking about before you came on? You know, I caught the few minutes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's related. You have to forgive me so though if I don't get involved in that because I'm not a public health expert. I'm not a doctor, and you know, frankly, if antibody tests are if they're accurate and if the um, plasma treatments using antibodies work, I think they're going to be a part of the equation. Um, I'm, I'm fine I, with that. But the issue is here is that the state government, Cuomo, is, and this kind of goes with your article, Cuomo is basically saying, we're going to go test people in the projects for antibodies, and we're going to grab people at the grocery store and test them for antibodies. Look, what, what, what's been preoccupying me, and again, without, you know, I don't know enough about the antibody test to know how and when and why you do it. What's been preoccupying me is the political side effects of this pandemic. And it seems to me that whether you're talking about coerced testing or whether you're talking about, um, you know, these immunity passports, they're talking about where we sort of basically segregate the population into these um, categories of people who can travel, people who can't travel, people who can go out in public, people who can't go out in public. Um, and then when we look at the sort of bigger picture, the way it's now being used as a cover, I mean, this extraordinary statement last night by Trump that he's going to shut down unilaterally all immigration US. I mean, this is like, you know, the isolation we're now talking about is Pol Pot's Cambodia, basically. It's this idea of locking the country away from the rest of the world and the rest of the world away from us. No democratic process, no congressional process, no semblance of legislative process. This is basically ruled by diktat, which is another way of saying dictatorship. And I think we're seeing this all over the world. America's not unique in this, that as the crisis intensifies, as publics get more scared, really authoritarian politicians are doing a kind of power grab that it's going to take decades to unravel. And that to me, you know, that to me is what I'm absolutely fixated on at the moment. How does our democracy survive this moment? That was the question I was going to ask you. We're speaking to Sasha Bronsky, freelance journalist and uh, teacher of professor of journalism at UC Davis. He writes the Signal Noise column twice a week for The Nation magazine and also a regular column for Truth Out. And he, you, you, I'm sure you know him because you've seen him in The Atlantic, The New Yorker, uh, New York Times, Guardian, Rolling Stone, Anywhere Truth is Told, uh, Mother Jones, American Prospect, and more. Thanks again for being with us today. Now you're a regular on Act TV. I'm going to add it into your bio. Happy to happy to be added. <laughs> Sasha, um, well, you and you asked the you know you said you've been following this. How does democracy survive? Your most recent piece from the president is not uh, your pre the president is not a king. Um, New York by uh, that's who New, uh, Tish James, our New York Attorney General, has says you're you're finding that the state governments are actually the ones who may be able to preserve democracy. If, if, you, if you look at what's been happening in America over the last two months, the federal government right from the get go dropped the ball. It, it didn't want to deal with the crisis because it was an inconvenience. It was seen as being an economic impediment. It was seen as mucking up um, President Trump's election prospects. And so the government for two months minimized it. They said, this isn't an issue. We've got it under control. It's going to miraculously disappear. It's all going to be gone by April. We can get on with our lives. Our case rates falling to nearly zero. I mean, these are basically verbatim quotes from Trump and from Pence. And of course, that's not the case. We've now got by far the highest infections in the world, number of infections in the world, the highest number of deaths in the world, completely inchoate federal response to our medical supplies. Um, you've got a president who gets up on national TV and instead of offer, offering empathy to the people who are dying and the families of people who are dying, he preens and he struts and he does these self-congratulatory press conferences and he insults journalists and he insults politicians he doesn't agree with and he goes after states whose governors are democratic. And meanwhile, the state governors, and it, you know, bipartisan, Mike Devine in Ohio is doing a pretty good job. Um, Gavin Newsom in California is doing a pretty good job. Cuomo's, you know, after you know, taking a while to actually realize the scale of the problem, Cuomo's been a pretty good manager of this. You, you've been seeing governors stepping in and saying, all right, the feds have dropped the ball. We're going to coordinate. We're going to put together contracts for medical supplies. We're going to start trading out ventilators to areas of the country that need it most at any one moment. And now they're saying, you know what, you can talk about reopening all you like, but we're going to do these regional compacts to do the reopening when it's safe. Mm -hmm. Now, the South is an exception. You're seeing this stampede in Republican states in the South to reopen their economies as their epidemics are, are cresting. And you know that's gonna be catastrophic. You know, Phil Kemp can say, we're gonna be careful. He can say all these things, 
but all the medical you think states should pull up Trump and say, OK, well, if your state is going to have an open policy during a pandemic, we're actually not going to let you into our block. Well, they, I, look, I mean, that's basically what's been happening. The, the sort of interstate compacts have been breaking down. So Hawaii, you know, more than a month ago, Hawaii declared a quarantine on anyone coming in, whether the U.S. or otherwise, to the islands. Uh, Florida began quarantining people from certain states, New York, New Jersey, New York. Connecticut and so on. Um, so you are seeing this sort of first. They didn't want us. Now that we've all, we're basically fixing our problem up here in the New York Northwest. Now we're not going to want you. Well, you know this. You know, I mean, you say it's sort of, you know, I mean, unfortunately, that's kind of what's happening, and it's not just happening in the United States. It's happening globally. So every country on Earth pretty much is locking down their borders. You know, China gained control of the epidemic domestically and then found it was being reimported. China's basically not letting anybody in at the moment, and the few it is letting in, it's quarantining. Um, America seems to now be about to model itself on China and completely wall itself off from the rest of the world. I mean, this, this stuff is- Isn't this what Trump wanted to do in the first place? He's, yeah, I mean, I mean, he's using this coronavirus to do the agenda that he was hoping to be able to push through. It's this completely dystopian, vision of what America is. And, you know, I read Philip Roth's book, The Plot Against America, a few years back, and it was about a sort of Charles Lindbergh-like character. Who, it's on HBO right now. You can watch it. On it's on HBO. And, you know, if you can stomach <laughs> it at the moment, it's yeah. it's a brilliant story, but it's so prescient because it's basically an authoritarian demagogue who seizes power, you know, sort of by a fluke with an ultra nativist agenda and then uses a series of crises as an excuse to lock the country down entirely and sort of push it into this fascist dystopian vision. And you're seeing that now, you know, the idea that the pandemic is a reason to shut down all immigration is absolutely nonsense. The, you know, the pandemic is a reason to have sensible precautions, maybe some kind of quarantines temporarily, you know, like we did in the nineties. Testing. How about testing and yeah. hospital beds? Testing. That's what so you when need. my great grandparents migrated, some of my great grandparents, despite my English accent, some of my great grandparents landed in America. And they came through Ellis Island. They they were fleeing pogroms, they were fleeing poverty in Eastern Europe. They came through Ellis Island at the end of the nineteenth, beginning of twentieth century. And Ellis Island had a medical checking process. That's yes. why it didn't just dock straight away in New York Harbor. You went to Ellis Island first. And doctors made sure you didn't have tuberculosis. They made sure you didn't have an eye disease to, called trachoma. They and then there sure was a hospital that you either went to and got better or they sent you back. They sent you back and they reserved the right to say you're a public health risk. We're sending you back. You can argue whether or not it was too strict, but the basic principle made sense. So, you know, this idea that somehow we can't have any immigration, you know, for an unidentified period because of the pandemic. This is nonsense. We had immigration during the Spanish flu, which killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Um, and incidentally, you know, this this idea that, you know, maybe we'll have to postpone the elections because of the pandemic. There were elections in 1918 at the height of the pandemic and tens of millions of Americans voted because the idea of preserving democracy was so important. So this uh, idea that we could just use any and every sort of authoritarian measure to counter the pandemic we got to get beyond that. We, we've got to find a way to preserve the democratic process and not just the process, but the culture of democracy and tolerance. How? <laughs> I mean, are there actual tangible ways that we could do this? We have to find a way to not cede the public ground to the far right, because at the moment, precisely because the far right is so anti-science, because it doesn't believe the public health experts, because it's open to anything and everything Trump and his acolytes say, because there's this cult of the personality going on, at the moment, the public ground has been ceded to the right because, you know, frankly, most progressives are abiding by public health orders, staying indoors, minimizing public interactions. And the right wing is coming out in these crazy demonstrations at state capitals with their guns and with their banners saying we don't believe in the coronavirus. We think it's fake news and basically controlling public space in a very destructive way. So somehow, you know, this crisis isn't going to go away tomorrow. We may have peaked. The first wave may have peaked at the moment. This is going to be with us for many months, maybe years. And it's going to, you know, upend the way we live and it's going to upend the way we do business, you know, in, in really sad ways and destructive ways. But within that, progressives have to calibrate. How do we get back into a situation where we can also protest, where we can also in some ways express ourselves? You know, Trump's banking on the fact we're also we're doing that here. You know, <laughs> yeah, Trump's basically assuming none of us are going to protest the fact that he's completely shut down immigration, which is frankly one of the most stunning moves in American political history. 
we have to find ways to protest. How we, is this legal? I mean, what can we do legislatively? What can our legislators do to... This is extra legislative. There's no process here. There's no pretense here. This is purely ruled by diktat. Now, they're going to be legal challenges. One would assume the ACLU and all the immigrants' rights groups who've been suing Trump for the last four years, you know, they will stampede to the courts the moment he signs that executive order. And almost certainly, because this is the history with these orders, the lower courts will immediately put a temporary restraining order on in the same way as they did with the Muslim travel ban, the same they, thing, way they did with the bans on asylum, the same ways they did when he tried to upend temporary protected status and DACA. And it will eventually go to the Supreme Court. And it's entirely possible this is all symbol politics because nobody's immigrating here at the moment anyway because there are no flights in. So this may just be nothing <laughs> more than Trump talking to his base. The danger is that he uses it to rally the base and rally the unemployed who he's saying he's doing this on behalf of, and that he could, you know, find a way in some sort of weird jujitsu political moment, he could find a way to claim that even though he was the one who bungled the pandemic response, even though their policies led to mass unemployment, whereas in Europe they managed to protect jobs by paying wages, the government paid wages, mm. maybe Trump will be able to sort of use this as a sort of thing saying, I am campaigning on behalf of the American people. These damn immigrants are trying to come in and steal your jobs, even during a pandemic. Ugh. And the danger is he gets political traction with this. And that's why we have to. And Joe Biden in particular, he's the Democratic nominee, like it or not. He's absolutely got to create a public presence in the next few days and marshal the tens of millions of people hundreds of millions of people in this country who don't who are agree. upset about this. Exactly. Actually Where is he? It's a mystery. I mean, this this is extraordinary. He's the Democratic nominee. It's Perhaps he has the virus. Crisis, maybe in American history, but certainly since World War II. And Biden's invisible. I mean, this is just such a sad moment that the Democratic nominee cannot find a way to inject himself into the conversation. I, I, you know, it, it leads one down the rabbit hole of, of thinking um, in terms of why, because with such a powerful party, the Democratic Party, you would think that they would be able to figure this out. Um, I don't think they're blundering. I know people on the teams. So, you know, it just leaves my open question to what is going on and why no, I, he is I, not. I, I mean, my, my theory is that, you know, Biden's never been particularly internet savvy. He's always been a guy who, you know, gets out there in the mix. He slaps backs, he shakes hands, he talks to people and that's how he operates. He, you know, and that's his, his methodology. It's, you know, it's, he sort of markets himself that way and like, and he's lost all of that. And Trump has this vast internet platform, and he's also got the fact that he can hold these briefings and, you know, by default, he gets free publicity. And this isn't Biden's ecosystem. This isn't where he's most comfortable at. Um, well, it's not like he has to run his own Twitter feed. I mean, there's a team, right? So well, one, would hope, one would hope there's a team. And, you know, there's also, <laughs> there's also people out there who are going to be over the next several months doing everything in, their, you know, everything in their power to push him. And that's going to include Barack Obama, who does have a vast internet presence. And it will include a lot of his defeated primary, primary um, rivals, including Bernie Sanders, who also has a huge internet presence. So I think you'll see a sort of, as we head towards the summer, as we head towards whatever kind of conventions there are, they'll probably be online instead of in person. But as we move closer to the election, I think you will see a strategy emerging to both increase Biden's visibility, but also use surrogates in a particularly sort of effective way. But at the moment, there's a void. And that void's getting increasingly dangerous because Trump's using that void to push these, you know, utterly, utterly. I mean, there's no other way to look at it. It is a fascistic vision of America that he's now pushing. It's not semi-fascistic. It's not sort of, you know, oh, for that fascism light. This is now a move to a completely reimagined vision of America. And Trump's playing the long game. This isn't just about, you know, the next two, three months in crisis. Trump's basically gambling that he can use this crisis to actually reinvent what America is. So we've always thought of ourselves with a land of opportunity, with a land of immigration, we're an open society, we're a pluralist society, we may be a flawed democracy, but we are a democracy. Trump's now saying, you know what, that stuff is from the past, that's for the birds, that's been and gone. Now we're in a post-coronavirus moment and we need authoritarianism. That's, that's the gambit that Trump's making. And if he's right, America in a few years will look nothing recognizable. And so I hope to hell he's wrong. And I, I think he is wrong. I, I don't think the public's going to stomach this. And I think when we work out ways to protest, there is going to be a righteous reaction to this because the idea that you can blame like undocumented or poor or vulnerable or just, you know, people seeking a new life, 
that you can blame immigrants for this crisis is so scandalous. And it's such a dereliction of duty to try and pass the buck like that. I don't, I don't think the public will buy it. We're speaking with Sasha Abramsky, writer and freelance journalist who writes the Signal Noise column twice a week for The Nation about how Trump, uh, about Trump's concerning pattern of authoritarian tendencies. I have a question coming in from our stream chat in Twitch. This is from Lauren. I've seen scattered reports about right wing groups linked to corporate interests being behind the coronavirus protest. Is there any validity to these claims? I've seen the same reports. I haven't investigated them. I don't know the accuracy. There are certainly a number of investigative reports out there that said that most of these groups that sprang up very, very quickly can be traced back to a handful of um, internet sites. They can be traced back to a handful of servers and that you know they come together with a very few people behind them. And you know I ran it by an investigative journalist friend of mine the other day and he looked it over and he said, yes, that looks about right, that it looks mm -hmm. like um, there has been this sort of behind the scenes effort by a few very conservative individuals and groups to sort of create these and pass them off as being these organic protests when they're actually highly coordinated. Mm. You know, as I said, I haven't prime, I haven't investigated that myself, but it could be true. Um, can you talk about what local leaders have been doing to make up for Trump's, uh, you know, lean authoritarianism? Uh, authoritarianism? I, I, I think the biggest thing is in states like California, where there's actually a huge financial push to help vulnerable people who've been deliberately excluded from the stimulus, the CARES Act. Yes. So, you know, there was- Can you tell people what that is in case they are, didn't yeah, read so, the article yet? <laughs> $2.2 trillion rescue package that was supposed to protect workers. It was supposed to, you know, protect businesses. It was supposed to bump up the amount of unemployment money that was sent out. So it would basically substitute for wages even while people were unemployed. Well, first of all, those things didn't go out very quickly. Second of all, it turned out there were these huge loopholes so workers didn't get nearly the protections that they were marketed as going to be receiving. And third of all, an awful lot of people were just excluded from the package. They didn't qualify. And the biggest group that didn't qualify is immigrants and families of immigrants, inclu including US citizens whose spouses happen to be immigrants. I mean, this is so insane. Um, anyway, California basically said, we've had enough of this, and they set up their own funds. So the, the governor set up what was called the Undocia Fund, and it was a public-private partnership, 75 million from the state, 50 million from private philanthropists, designed to get out grants of about $1,000 to $1,500 to undocumented families. Now, you know, it's a drop in the bucket of what's actually needed, but it's at least a gesture in the right direction. LA did the same thing. LA basically was so frustrated with the fact that these stimulus checks just weren't going out mm -hmm. that it set up what was called the Angelino card. And the Angelino card is a, an EBT card, a bit like food stamps card. And again, it was raised with private money. This isn't LA sort of saying, we're gonna sort of put tens of millions of dollars into this. This is LA saying, if you're wealthy, we need your help right now. And a lot of people came forward and they gave money. And there's $50 million that's being distributed in LA to low income families who can prove hardship because of coronavirus and who haven't received the stimulus check. And those are being given out as EBT cards. The um, process for applying was last week. They're being distributed, I believe, in the next couple of weeks. And again, $1,000, $1,500, I think it caps at $1,500 for a larger family. You know, none of this substitutes for an effective federal government response, but all of it is indicative of the fact that progressive states are basically saying, look, you guys are doing such a terrible job we're going to try and reinvent the social contract ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with, you know, the insurance exchanges. Federal government refused in the middle of a pandemic to reopen the Affordable Care Act insurance exchange, even though tens of millions of people were losing their jobs and many of them were losing their health insurance. Mm -hmm. Most of the states that have their own exchanges, which are overwhelmingly democratic states, said, you know what, we're opening our own exchanges. So California, New York, all the states with their own exchanges you can enroll at the moment, which means if you lose your job, you can get health insurance again fairly easily. This seems like we are on the road to actually breaking, some states are on the way to breaking up with the federal government. Because at what if the states are doing what they need to do themselves, at what point would the federal government become unnecessary? Well, this is really interesting. And I don't think, I, I mean, I can't imagine a scenario where a governor literally gets up and says, we're seceding. I don't, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but you can certainly see a scenario where California, for example, which does have these vast financial resources of its own and many of these sort of market infrastructures that are in place to function independently, 
you can see a scenario where California basically says, you know what, this is so dysfunctional, it's so irrational, and the federal government is so authoritarian at the moment that we're going to absolutely minimize our relationship with the feds. So, you know, California can't control its own immigration system, for example, but you can certainly see a scenario where California's legislative leaders, you know, essentially accuse the U.S. government of behaving illegally and try and set up some kind of, you know, functional temporary alternative process. I don't know how it would work. I don't know if it could work. Um, but certainly Trump is pushing all of the limits of union at the moment because he's putting so many stresses onto the rationale for that union. You know, we stay a big country because it's beneficial to all 50 states to be a process. At the moment, you know, you have these stories of Trump basically holding Democratic states hostage by refusing to send medical supplies their way. I mean, this is insanity. And, this you know, is there's been a lot, a lot written about how this is effectively a blockade being done by conservative federal government people against liberal states. You can't do that in the union. I was just thinking, uh, do, do you think that we're going to see that once the uh, the 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 center of the pandemics go more to the red states, to the blue states. Do you think there'll be a more robust federal response to save? I don't think they have the capacity. I don't think they have the capacity. They ran out, you know, they ran through the um, national stockpiles of protective gear and so on. There is no spare capacity. And they've done a terrible job of ramping up that spare capacity. You know, finally, there's some more testing going on because everybody, Democrats and Republicans alike, basically said, you know, your testing regime is so woefully inadequate. So finally, they are getting testing a little bit more up to speed, though you know, nowhere near enough, according to the public health experts, to get you know, the economy functioning again safely. Um, no, I think it's far more likely Republican states will open up and they will see surges in fatalities. And it will be racially disproportionate because all the evidence is that in the large cities where the outbreaks have occurred, African-Americans who have less access to health care, who tend to work more in public sector jobs where they're in the public and so on, are getting exposed and are dying at higher rates. And I think that will hold true, you know, up to a point in the South too. And unfortunately, because of the South's racial history, you're going to have an awful lot of Trump voters in Southern states who just discount that. And as long as it doesn't affect them personally, they're going to say, hey, what's the problem? We did the right job opening up for business. And, you know, this is the ultimate collapse of an idea of communalism. You know, at a moment of pandemic, we, we rise or sink together. I mean, you know, not just nationally, but globally. And what we've seen is Trump turning his back on the world, spurning the world, defunding the World Health Organization, doing all the wrong things that you want to do for a global response in the pandemic. And then nationally, Trump supporters basically saying, we don't give a damn about anyone else as long as we personally are okay. And, you know, this, this is selfishness taken to the nth degree. And I don't, I don't know how these people who are sort of getting up and, you know, going to these state capitals with guns and protesting. I, I don't know how they sort of morally rationalize this. Oh, they just let Fox News do it for them. <laughs> Fox News comes up with some moral, you know, rationalization for them. I saw one of one woman holding a sign saying, my body, my choice with a mask, you know, a video or, or a, a, a drawing of a mask. Insane. <laughs> Absolutely insane. Um, we're speaking with Sasha Abramsky. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Abramsky with an with a Y. Sasha S A S H A. What are you? What's coming up? What are you writing about uh, next? You know, I just did a long feature article for the Nation, which I, I guess will come out fairly soon on um, undocumented garment workers and domestic workers and home care workers. You know, these these men and women earn a pittance. I mean, some of the garment workers I spoke to earn, you know, peace, their paid peace rate, they may take home $200, $250 a week, and they're all laid off. And in the home care industry, a lot of them actually have COVID because they're working with sick patients. That's what they do. And they've all been let go. And they have no access to benefits because they're undocumented. And these, you know, when Trump demonizes these people, you know, one reason we have affordable clothing is because there are an awful lot of undocumented workers working these ghastly jobs for very low wages. One reason we can afford, you know, to have our houses cleaned is because there are an awful lot of undocumented people who do it cheap. You know, one reason we can afford to pass off our elderly relatives onto, you know, strangers to look after is because other people do it on the cheap. And so, you know, these people are doing the dirty jobs of our society and we're basically putting them to one side. And so I'm, I was doing a story on what's happening to these men and women. Um, and I think over the next 
few months, I can't imagine not focusing on immigration. I mean, this to me is the moral issue of our time. The, the public health crisis, it's terrifying and it's horrifying, and it will one day be something in the past because public health crises do eventually dissipate. But the legacy, what it's going to do to our immigration system, our politics, that's going to remain. And so I think, you know, I imagine I'm going to be preoccupied with that and, you know, everything else in the run up to this ugly, ugly election that we're going to be experiencing. Well, we look forward to having you back on the program. Again, it seems like it was just yesterday, but really it was two weeks ago. And um, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Have a good two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're speaking that with Sasha Abramsky. You can follow him on Twitter at Abramsky. Sasha, I will put it in the Twitch chat. If you're watching on YouTube, we ask you to subscribe to our channel. We do about maybe 10 around interviews every week with newsmakers, journalists, activists, uh, anyone on the progressive side whose voice needs to be amplified. So please follow us on YouTube and share this channel with friends of yours, ask them to follow, et cetera. Thank you very much for watching.